a brave new plant biosecurity system over the horizon musings, which I'm going to talk about. However, uh, I want to first of all acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. In that acknowledgement, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So in this presentation, I'm just going to quickly run through what I'm going to be talking about, OK? So first of all, I'm going to talk about what biosecurity actually is. So we'll just get that, that same understanding across the board. I'll talk about a term called the biosecurity continuum. You need to understand that in, a, in order to understand the system that we operate in Tasmania or, or anywhere, in fact. The importance of biosecurity to Tasmania, I'll also talk about that. And then I'll talk about the Tasmanian biosecurity system that we have. Then we get to the fun bit about the Tasmanian plant biosecurity system of 2030. So effectively, uh, what I'm starting off with is talking more generally about biosecurity, then I'll focus in on, on uh, plant biosecurity because uh, plants is, is my thing. I'm also going to talk about some challenges that any biosecurity system has that we have to, to keep in mind in terms of to be able to operate that. And then I'm going to give, just finish off with describing how you can actually participate in terms of maintaining our own biosecurity system. So before we do, let's see if this works. I just want to give you a bit of a, a, a general one. The, the, I've, I'm be showing you three clips today. They're all Australian biosecurity clips. The principles apply to Tasmania just the same, but they're very informative. Biosecurity protects Australia from pests and diseases that could impact on our industries, environment, plants, animals and communities. It helps keep pests and diseases out, but it also helps manage their impact if they do arrive here. This is a big job, one that is growing and becoming more challenging every day. Pests and diseases are spreading all around the world. Over the next decade, more cargo and mail will arrive in Australia than ever before, and this could bring more pests and diseases to our doorstep. We are taking steps to manage these growing pest and disease risks by strengthening our defences at the border, using innovations, new technologies and science, working with importers, farmers and the community, our near neighbours and other countries, managing pests and diseases before they arrive in Australia and increasing penalties for those who do the wrong thing when travelling to Australia or importing goods. These steps will help us build a stronger biosecurity system that has many layers of defence. A strong, smart biosecurity system is all that stands between Australia and the significant, growing biosecurity risks we face. Learn more about biosecurity and what you can do to help at biosecurity.gov.au. Here. Uh, my favourite definition is the men in black definition, protecting the earth from the scum of the universe. Uh, and, and, you know, coincidentally, is this coincidence? I'm actually wearing a black suit today. That was coincidence. <laughs> the middle definition there really is the official definition, and that's what, that's what we use uh, in terms of our own biosecurity system. So a system of measures, practices and regulations that combine to mitigate the risk of the negative impacts of plant pest diseases and weeds at the property, region, state, national and international level. So that's all it's about. It's all about doing different actions and activities which can manage risk uh, arising from uh, pest plants, weed, uh, pest uh, diseases and weeds. So why is biosecurity of importance to Tasmania? Eric before mentioned we're an island state that gives us a huge advantage. So we have a specific focus on biosecurity. We have a relatively low pest uh, disease and weed pressure, particularly in a lot of the exotics. So we have basically interstate, there are uh, pests and diseases and weeds which we don't have here, which is a positive. Why is that important? In terms of our production, there are production benefits, benefits and market edges you can get in terms of being able to manage uh, a lot cheaply. Brand value and image, that low biosecurity status directly underpins our, uh, our island advantage and the brand for our export markets. 
Importantly, we're a small economy. So if we have incursions here, exotic incursions, the impacts on our industry can be relatively, compared to the rest of Australia, very relatively large. And of course, lifestyle choice, health and safety. Uh, people choose to live in Tasmania for the lifestyle. We can have incursions of various uh, pests and diseases. Red reefer, red imported fire ant is one which can certainly destroy amenity, impacts the environment and can make uh, barbecues very unpleasant. A unique environment. So we have island flora and fauna, which are, which are very unique. The, the disadvantage for that is that they're very vulnerable to some of the exotic incursions which are possible. And that last one, I've emphasised that, and that's something that I think is really important. A loss of status is very difficult to regain. So this is really all about prevention is far better than cure. And I'll just illustrate that sort of visually, and this is really what it's all about. So what I've just spoken about, lifestyle and environment, the various industries that we have within the state, they all depend on having an effective biosecurity system. That underpins, that underpins basically everything we do with it on the island. And then you might translate that to dollars in terms of what's it all worth. Keeping in mind this is a focus just on the gross value of primary industries in 2019-20. Uh, in 2.15 billion farm gate values. So that's not even value added. And that's only the primary industries element. Uh, the environmental services and ecological integrity that come from uh, maintaining a high biosecurity status. Controversial in terms of how do you put a dollar value on that. Uh, a rule of thumb is double your industry value. And then there's all the other benefits. There's the flow on effects in terms of tourism and those sorts of things. So what, what I guess what I'm getting at here is that an effective biosecurity system from a monetary point of view protects billions of dollars uh, which are for the state. So let's talk about the system that protects that. So it's government led. So the Department of Natural Resource and Environment that I work for uh, is the agency that has lead responsibility. Biosecurity Tasmania, which people may have heard of, Biosecurity Tasmania is a business unit of the NRE. Government policy is a foundation, and I'll talk a bit about the policy, but, but the whole system operates on a, on a published, published government policy, and that's really important. I'll explain that shortly. It's also operated using a strategic plan. Once again, I'll talk about that in a little detail shortly. Very important. So Biosecurity Tasmania delivers on, for the biosecurity system, delivers on plant biosecurity, animal biosecurity, invasive species, and also provides diagnostic services. And with that delivery, we also have that operational arm that delivers on uh, all those things we need. So the Tasmanian, Tasmanian biosecurity system, we're subject to international and national accountability. Our regulations have to be evidence-based, transparent, and consistent. These are the elements of the Sanitary Phytosanitary Agreement, which is part of the World Trade Organization agreements, which Australia is a signatory to. Now, the major this, is, this is a really important point. The majority of the biosecurity system is invisible to citizens. And I'll explain why that's really important a little later. I describe the system as a machine with many interlocking, interlocking components. It's complicated, it's complex. The general public contact generally is at the border. So that's where most people see it. When you come into the state, you see the biosecurity officers, you may see the dogs, you see the checks, that sort of thing. But that's really just that one element. Every day, Tasmanians unknowingly benefit from the system. And I've described in other presentations, people sit down and have their dinner at night. They don't necessarily realise that an effective biosecurity system is actually enabling them to do that. I've already talked about the, the coverage there in relation to, to Biosecurity Tasmania. This is the, the biosecurity continuum which I was uh, referring to. This is a really important concept. The system we have is based on a series of activities uh, and requirements at, at, at pre-border and at border and at post-border. So, for instance, at post-border, at uh, the pre-border point, we have... Uh, quality assurance requirements for product entering the state. We have uh, import requirements which are set up that people have to abide by. 
They're all based on risk analysis. A lot of work goes on. The principle is that we manage risk offshore as much as we can. And then, of course, the border, which I've already said there, is that, uh, that that's sort of the, the, the quarantine intervention. So they're the control entry points to the state, physical inspection, that sort of thing. But, of course, we also have to have post-border mechanisms there, and that's ongoing surveillance and monitoring. So we, we're constantly checking to see that, the, that we don't have those, those incursions, those exotics. From time to time, we will. Nothing's perfect. So we have to have the ability to respond to those effectively. The other, in the middle there, the, the really, one of the really important points is the system is not nil risk. It's based on, a, on a, a, an acceptance of a very low level of risk. Nil risk is just not possible. It's not realistic. However, we can mitigate risk down to very low levels. Shared responsibilities and partnerships are really important. It's, biosecurity might be led by the government, but its success is dependent on, on everyone, on us, on citizens, on industries, people coming to the state, Tasmanians going into state or overseas and returning. I'm going to put a plug in for my own branch at the moment. So there's a, a photo of my branch some, uh, some months ago. The staff that, that, that are within my branch, uh, we're primarily science, legal, market access, trade and communications expertise. So you can see just in that, in terms of the plant area, quite a diverse range of skills are required. We have approximately 25 staff uh, and we're, we're team structured and, as I say, based on disciplines. The, the, bran the, the, the branch is actually uh, decentralised, so we have locations uh, across the state, northwest, north and south. Uh, and this is the, the, the groups or the teams that we have. We have plant biosecurity policy. The people there are the risk analysts. Uh, that, this is where policy is also developed. We have a recently developed area freedom unit, which is basically gathering information and evidence in support of our area freedom status and claims for trade. We also have specialists in trade and market access as well. And of course, communications, because that's a, a really important part of the, the biosecurity is the messaging. The plant biosecurity diagnostics. So my branch encompasses our, di our government diagnostic laboratories for, for plants. And within that, there are two teams, plant pathology and entomology. We, also, we have the traditional entomologist, traditional plant pathologist, but we also have molecular capacity using DNA. As I said, the primary labs are in the south. We currently have uh, satellite laboratories up at uh, Launceston, up at the Mount Pleasant Laboratories for entomology, and also at Stony Rise Government Centre for entomology. Another important part of the branch's functions is the national representation and participation. Tasmania is on the national stage, and we have to be. We need to participate in, uh, in, in national systems and national developments. Uh, and we also need to, to protect our own interests there on the national stage as well. We have a lead, our activities are run on a program basis and we have a lead in that. I mentioned the policy before. So we have a policy foundation called, called, the, uh, called the Tasmanian Biosecurity Policy. And that is, uh, that's, that's published on the website. The importance of that, that's the mandate, that's the political support mandate. It's tripartite as well, so it goes across, across the board in terms of the, whatever the, the political uh, flavour is of the day. Key elements, I'll zip through those. Uh, we have an appropriate level of protection. I mentioned that about the, the very low level of risk. That's called appropriate level of protection. Australia operates under that as well. So it's a, it's a commitment to a conservative, uh, very low level of biosecurity risk being accepted. Uh, least restrictive requirements, I mentioned that as well, so that's a, that's a legal requirement on us. We also have evidence-based risk analysis, so all our decision-making, we, uh, we have a published document on, on our website, which is how we make decisions based on risk analysis. Risk-based resource allocation, uh, that's an important part as well. Uh, as a, a biosecurity is a really expensive business. You have to use your money very wisely. You have to invest it appropriately to get the best outcome. And that, that connects to the cost benefit. Uh, whole of government approach. So even though our agency is the lead from a government point of view, other government agencies have also have interests. And probably a, uh, a, a reasonably good example recently is, is, is the, was the current COVID 
uh, pandemic and you know, the interaction in terms of Department of Health as well. The biosecurity system I talk about doesn't cover human biosecurity as such, but there clearly there's interfaces and particularly where there are zoonotic diseases, so you know, animal to, uh, to human spread and those sort of things. And the shared responsibilities. Each of these is a published and committed to policy position which underpins our system. How do we translate that policy into reality? It's through a, a strategic plan, and that's the Tasmanian biosecurity strategy. Uh, the, the, the picture down there, I'll, I'll make mention of that in case I forget, because it's important I don't. Our strategic plan, the first one came out in 2006, based and inspired by the New Zealand's plan. And New Zealand really are the, have been the masters in terms of systematic approach to biosecurity and protecting the, their, their country. And, uh, and that plan was, was the inspiration uh, for our own approach. But so it's a strategic vision, uh, classic strategic plan. Uh, it's, it's got, uh, it consists of 11 outcomes. Uh, it details what we need to do to achieve those outcomes. Uh, it's overseen currently by Biosecurity Tasmania. We've got a new strategy that's coming into place, which is overseen by a, a, a committee, the Biosecurity Advisory Committee, which has been formed under the new legislation, the Biosecurity Act that we have. Why this is important is the plan itself. If all those elements are implemented, we've got a functioning biosecurity system which is acceptable. It doesn't mean it's exclusive of anything else, but it's the minimum requirement to operate so that we can be effective. Uh, it guides our planning. We refer back to that. I mentioned the program planning before that guides that. And that's subject to a four-year rolling review and currency. As I say, there'll be a new plan coming out shortly. So let's get on to the fun bit. This is, the, this is looking ahead, and, and I'm going to concentrate now on the, the plant biosecurity system, but can apply to, ad, to other parts of the system as well. But this is, this is my looking ahead. Uh, as to, uh, to what things can look like. And thanks to Pink Floyd for the, uh, for the, the image of the robot handshake. Uh, three elements there. The way I describe this is an edge. So what we've tried to do, what I've tried to do for 2030 is envisage what things can be like there. So, I'll, I'll, I won't read them out in detail, but the edge, for instance, the island state of Tasmania is one of the last locations on the planet to maintain an exceptionally high biosecurity status, providing high value trade and environmental benefits. A very realistic outcome if we maintain our system, biosecurity pressures internationally are huge and they're increasing rapidly. Movement of people, movement of commodities, uh, the spread of, of pests and diseases. If you can maintain an area which is relatively pristine, it's actually worth a lot of money. The system, I'm going to talk about that, and I describe in that my envisaging a system which is a digital system, technologically based, but still serviced by people. People will never be uh, eliminated from the system, thankfully. Uh, the delivery as well, different ways you can deliver it. I look ahead, and, and I, I, I probably should put a proviso here that these are my thoughts that I'm giving, they're not, they're not government policy, but looking ahead, uh, you know, an, a, a statutory agency would be quite an effective way, I think, to deliver a biosecurity system into the decades ahead. So pre-border, we're going to be we're going to be basing a lot of our work on uh, models, predictive risk models. We've seen a lot of modelling work done through the COVID pandemic. It's sort of it's taken a quite a big role in terms of guiding what needs to be done. The idea being in terms of those models and the gathering of data, big data, which is basically systems that collect in whole ranges of data which can be analysed. I talk about the minority report approach, which is basically preventing something before it occurs. And that's the gold standard with, it, with your biosecurity system. So uh, data to intelligence, that's the other important thing. You can collect lots of information, but you need to convert it into something useful. Intelligence gathering systems offshore, I'm going to see, I think we'll see a lot more memorandums of understanding both nationally and internationally. We'll see an inter interconnected system of data sharing. It's critically important internationally for success of biosecurity that we have international cooperation. What we don't want are, are silos in terms of those systems. What happens in another country biosecurity wise is of interest and value to us. 
I mentioned web scrapers there. There's a good system the Australian government use at the moment called IBIS, which can go around and analyzes the occurrences on the web, which are reports on various diseases and pests, gathers them all together, analyzes them, and presents a, a succinct report on what's occurring where, and can then assess the threat of that to, to Australia. And import regulations, as I say, these are the effective. We, we use a lot of these, you know, particularly plant biosecurity. Uh, and these are, these are, I think, will be a lot more fine-tuned and industry-specific into the future. We'll have the information to do that. Sometimes they're, they're a bit generic, a bit of a big hammer there, just as a precautionary approach, but I think we can fine-tune those. The technically based and consistent with trade obligations, I think we're largely there, actually, the way we, we operate those, so that's good. Uh, They'll be structured to strengthen even more that offshore, that policy of offshore risk management. Uh, and then also, I think we'll be moving more into a, an, an enabling uh, regulatory system. So a yes, you can as long as, rather than uh, no, you can't because. That in my mind is the, is the, is the, the big killer into the future. Data to intelligence, data is power. Knowledge is power, information is power. The ability to gather data, to analyse it, and to use that to guide how we do things is, is really positive. So at the border, we're going to see a lot more, I think, secure traceability systems. So these will be digitally based, they'll be secure. But for instance, you know, a mango coming from Queensland will know exactly where it's come from, even possibly the tree. We'll know its movement, where it's gone, what treatments it's had when, and when it enters the state, and we can do tracebacks very easily, it'll be digitally based. The elements of this are in place already, but it's not a comprehensive system. What really is interesting there is the role that it has in provenance, uh, and also food safety, but also anti-fraud. So one of the key things there, there, there are this instruments, even now you can do that, where the product can be DNA typed at this end and checked at this end, and you can check there's been no substitution. This is really important in the in international markets, particularly where substitution uh, can occur. So these are just checks and balances against that. We've already done some work with some, some companies in relation to this. AgLive is one company. There's, there's multiple companies working on traceability systems for a whole range of products now. Detection technologies, X-ray entry points. We've done that a little bit in Tasmania in the past. We certainly do that now. So in our postal areas behind the scenes, product uh, parcels and that letters are X-rayed. Uh, I think we'll see that become more mainstream, a bit like we see internationally, particularly for New Zealand, but at the border. Uh, security checks and arrangements, I think, will become far more adaptable. Uh, pro pro yeah, probably easy, easier to implement and easier on people entering. However, we'll also, I think, have a lot more electronic detection units set up. And this is a really interesting area as well, the, the, the basically digital uh, checks on product and then the determination if you know, matter is there that shouldn't be there. Robotic inspection, maybe it's getting out. I I'm sure it'll take different forms, but I think ro robotic robots will play a greater part in inspection as well with product coming into the state. And this machine advice and awareness already happening. Uh, New Zealand uh, have, have done studies on using holograph, holographic people there, giving a message. We actually, within Tasmania, I don't know if you notice, the bins at the airport uh, are talking bins. So, you know, those bins where you're asked to put stuff in if you've accidentally brought some across, and the message is being put there. I think we'll see that build a lot more, and that will be become a lot more advisory in terms of machines doing that for us. The dog we won't lose. Uh, and, and I've had, I, you, you hear this, particularly the advocates on the electronic detection and the electronic noses and all that saying we'll replace dogs, we'll replace dogs. I don't think we will. We certainly won't in 10 years because uh, dogs are, are, are pretty impressive in terms of what they can do. And with that, I'm going to attempt to give you a break from my voice. Since 1992, biosecurity detector dogs have actively contributed to Australia's frontline defence against damaging biosecurity risks. From just a pair of dogs in Sydney and Brisbane, to dogs deployed across the country from Perth to Norfolk Island, the program has grown considerably. Although the department initially used beagles, Labradors now make up the entire canine workforce. 
Their extraordinary sense of smell and cooperative, gentle nature make them top-notch detectors. Our labs are trained to detect over 200 items that may pose a biosecurity risk. The most common items being seeds, meat, live plants and fruit. The dogs detect more than 65,000 biosecurity risk items each year, with individual dogs making more than 9,000 detections in their working life. These detections provide critical protection for our $60 billion agricultural industries and the health of our communities, economy, environment and unique wildlife. A single piece of undeclared fruit or a meat product can carry serious and devastating risks. The Detector Dog program works side by side with other government departments and officials, including their canine compatriots from the Australian Border Force. You can tell the difference by the bright red jackets worn by our biosecurity detector dogs. At the International Airport Passenger Terminal, our dogs may sit beside a passenger or baggage. This is called a passive response. A correct passive response is given a food reward. Make sure you know what's in your bags, as our labs will sniff out everything from large food items to the smallest of seeds. When screening objects in mail facilities, the dogs will dig at the source of a target odour. This is called an active response. A correct active response is given a play reward. We select our detector dogs from the Australian Border Force Breeding Program. The puppies are fostered by volunteer families until they're around 18 months old, when they are selected for work with the Australian Border Force, Australian Federal Police, or with us, combating biosecurity threats. We put the young dogs through a rigorous eight-week training program. From there, the dogs have a working life of about six to eight years. When they retire from their biosecurity role, they're placed into loving homes, in many cases, with one of their former handlers. We continue to modernise and evolve our detector dog program as part of an integrated biosecurity system. Biosecurity, it's everyone's responsibility. So who'd want to replace dogs anyway? <laughs> so the final part of the, the system the dog talked about in that continuum is the post-border part of it. So post-border, focus there on surveillance particularly. Uh, an area that I'm particularly interested in is the, is, and which I, I, I see will occur as an electronic surveillance grid, grid for pests and diseases, or potential pests and diseases. And this can, this can we can do this quite effectively on an island state. Fantastic setup for something like this. Uh, and that could take many forms. So we can have you know, th things like aphid towers and those sorts of things. And elements, some of these elements, these manual ones we, we've got which do exist, they require manual servicing, collecting, you know, entomologists looking at them. Into the future they can be electronic and they're connected uh, via the internet and, and we can gather data from them like that. Uh, an interesting one as well is, is it's not only visual, it's not only traps and those sort of things, but it's also uh, audio as well. So the possibility of having audio detectors. So if we have, you know, uh, ex uh, birds coming in like Indian miners and that sort of thing, which have a certain call, they can be picked up through the microphones and that, and that gives us an early alert. Early, early alerts and early intervention with anything biosecurity uh, related is absolutely critical. You don't get on the front foot, first of all, you lose it. Uh, one that I one that I'm really really like is the uh, is the rapid aim traps, and there's a whole range of smart traps. So there's a picture of one there, and these are uh, traps which basically, and I'll, I'll show you a little clip in a minute on those. But these are traps basically which can uh, detect various pests, and uh, and this one this is set up for fruit fly can come in can be detected, you get an electronic warning which goes through and is connected through. Effectively, the traps are monitored through a control room, an internet-connected control room. So you don't have necessarily officers going out and checking traps you know, that, that are empty, but you still have to have that, that, uh, that amount of manual work going on. You get the detection of when something is coming in. So that this is pretty impressive stuff. Still early stages, though the Rapid Aim has, is, is operating. The Rapid Aim is a CSIRO, uh, CSIRO spin-off company. And we've done a little bit of work with them. Uh, the other thing is unmanned aerial vehicles, the roles of those. And I think we'll see applications coming in there. Probably hasn't taken off as quick as it could, given 
given the, uh, the time that we've already had drones available to us, but I think they'll be used a lot more in terms of doing inspections, particularly to areas, environmental areas, where it's difficult for people to go. Uh, and of course, people, and I mentioned people before, I think uh, early response units are trained staff, so I illustrate that. <laughs> Into the future, a dad's army of early responders. You know, it's critically important, and I, I put that there because the, I've been talking about technologies here, the human element is massively important in all of this. What I might do is just run this rapid, this little YouTube clip. Might wait for some tech support on that. So this is just a short clip about that, those traps, the smart traps, but it, it, it explains, I can go, thanks. It explains quite well, I think, uh, you know, what that technology can look like and how it can be effective. And I say it's not an endorsement, <laughs> it's just something we're familiar with. Rapid M is an award-winning, world-first digital pest surveillance and management system for agriculture. It enables growers to better monitor and manage fruit fly population on their farms. Rapid Aim consists of a grid of smart IoT traps equipped with a revolutionary sensor. This sensor can recognize the unique fingerprint of a fruit fly among hundreds of other insects. When a detection happens, the trap sends data to the cloud and back to you through an iOS or Android app. You will instantly know when and where fruit flies are active. Rapid Aim is easy to set up and maintain. It is scalable and ready for mass deployment. It's also price point competitive with any traditional pest management plan. Jump into the future of food production. Contact Rapid Aim today and let us help you make pest surveillance easier than ever. I guess the point, uh, the point of that particular clip is that uh, these technologies are developed and they're being used at the moment. So, yeah, so as, as I say, there, there's a whole range of those. I mean, and that, that particular technology is very clever. It detects the certain movement patterns of the insect. Some of the earlier ones, and there's other versions which actually use photographic detection. So there's little cameras built in and they can actually photograph. Uh, and they've got algorithms which can pick up the, you know, that this is likely to be a, uh, you know, an Asian honeybee or something like that. Uh, and that sends a signal back straight away. One of the big things with traps is, uh, is bycatch, and uh, you know, bycatch actually polluting results. Well, this sort of thing can actually uh, get around that. And the other thing which I do want to mention is advanced diagnostic tools. So who's heard of PCR and rapid antigen tests? Everybody. Exactly. <laughs> so it's polymerase chain reaction. Yeah, the, the, the COVID pandemic basically has, uh, uh, has mainstreamed these sorts of terms. And I was listening to a presentation the other day. It's also, it's also enhanced the, the health knowledge of the general population. You know, people are aware of this now. Now, those, those tools and those techniques have been around for a long time. And you know, we use them in animal biosecurity and plant biosecurity and, and have for a very long time. But it's, it's mainstreamed. Uh, but what's important is that these sorts of key technologies, and even something like the COVID pandemic, really boosts the development of these sorts of technologies and, and makes them move along a lot quicker. And a lot of the technology is also linked to and driven by, the di by digital technology development, so internet things and, and that sort of thing, and I'll illustrate that in a moment. One of the things which has been, which is the flavour of the day, I guess, in terms of diagnostics, is environmental DNA. And wherever you go, you hear eDNA, e -DNA, eDNA. And why it's important, it's the ability to detect fragments of genetic material that may be floating in the air, in soil, uh, in water. That's massive sensitivity. There's a national eDNA reference centre which is uh, being developed. Uh, and there's testing technologies being developed and available which are mobile and can be deployed in in-field, importantly by non-scientists. All of a sudden, this sort of amazing technology in terms of diagnostics, quick, accurate diagnostics can be done, can be implemented without that, the scientific structure around it. So that's transformative in terms of uh, knowing what's out there and determining that. And just to illustrate that, this is the sort of stuff I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, I was at the same meeting, the Australian Biosecurity Symposium three years ago. A lot of these technologies have been talked about. I was at this meeting now and there was a trade stand and they were actually selling the technologies that have been developed in, the, in that short time. And this, this sort of stuff sort of gets me a bit excited, but <laughs> real-time PCR anywhere you need it. These small PC, portable PCR kits which can be used. Normally you'd have to have a full lab, you'd be waiting you know, days or weeks for, for results. Uh, process DNA or RNA samples in one to two minutes. And that one, turn your smartphone into a mobile PCR lab. I mean, that's pretty incredible. In terms of technological development, diagnostic technological development, in a relatively short period of time, project 10 years ahead, what are things going to look like? Very exciting. So just to, in closing, I'm going to just cover off on, on drivers and challenges. Now, i just emphasise these are my own thoughts as well, once again. But these are the sort of things that I want to refer to in terms of maintaining a, an effective biosecurity system, the sort of things we have to be looking at. Leadership's absolutely critical. It's a, leadership is essential for visionary and brave progress. And that's where the brave comes from. You can't set up a biosecurity system and just leave it to, to plug away. It's constantly evolving, constantly developing, constantly expanding, and having to meet the, the increased risks and the challenges which are, which are out there, which are rapidly increasing. And that's, as of the last few minutes, the sort of things we need to be looking at into the future are absolutely critical. That requires leadership. Leadership is a rare commodity. It also requires it, part of that formal commitment to forward strategic planning and drive. Once again, you can't build this thing and just let it plug away forever and never change it. It has to be kept current and has to be driven. Public sector resourcing. Now, as a public servant, you know, you don't normally talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it in sort of a general sense and a realistic sense as well. Uh, public resources in, in, in governments, resourcing in governments, can often be a challenge. Uh, it can be famine or flood. It's the reality. That's just what it is. Resources come and go, resources up and down. You need, a, you need enough resources within a biosecurity system, certainly to maintain it. One of the key things, though, the resources you do have, they're investments, and you have to ensure that you're using them in the best possible way and that you're also uh, going to get a return on that investment. So my view on the biosecurity system is, is the resourcing is an investment. If you're not getting a return back on that, you probably shouldn't be putting the money into it. There has been real-time disinvestment in biosecurity systems by major stakeholders. That's often taken the form of possibly not increasing resource, maintaining it over time. Uh, uh, in, in the past few years, it hasn't been much an issue, but where you've got inflationary pressures and that sort of thing, that tends to, to drop uh, the resourcing down. These are all the things that a biosecurity system manager has to be aware of. They're realities. So the biosecurity system has to be resilient. You have to be able to cope with that. And this is an interesting one, technology applications, the smart traps I spoke about. Often trade agreements are set up based on certain systems. To negotiate a trade agreement with an overseas country can take years. Some of this technology now is being developed so fast. So things like you know, smart traps and that, can we use them in a trade in a, where, where we're trading with another country? We may not be able to use them straight away. We, we will eventually, but it's just keeping pace with the technology, which is getting faster and faster. Uh, organisational commitment to future-proofing systems. So it's not all about the here and now, it's about the future. We need people to be looking ahead one decade, two decades, three decades. Uh, I think the limited drivers to change, one of the key things there, and I think this arises from the population's lack of awareness. I'd mentioned before, a biosecurity system is, uh, is often invisible uh, to many, uh, and I think people don't necessarily have an awareness of that. So there's no real drive necessarily from the population. And this is one which is a, probably a little bit of a hobby horse of mine, but it's a, it's a national and international anti-science and anti-logic drift. And that's been one of the things over, uh, well, over recent years, which has been a concern. Biosecurity systems are based on science. They're based on current science and they're based on good science. You can't afford to white ant it. I think this, this is a, an interesting publication, The March of Unreason. Dick Tavern published that book in, uh, I think it was about 2004. So a fair few years ago. 
So, as I said, it's based on science. And so, in, in a sense, in democracies, the systems are dependent on us, on you as a population and our political representatives. So they are vulnerable to anti-science trends and shifts. I've talked about shifts towards a new dark age. Is that dramatic? Maybe it is a bit. But nevertheless, we've got to ensure that science isn't undermined and that it's supported and, and respected. Threatening political shifts internationally around the world, uh, though there tends to have been a bit of a reversal of that, I think, in recent times. Touchstone of enlightenment I've always used is the climate science and resp political responses to that. They're always warning signs. We're talking about climate systems there. Biosecurity systems are much the same. And the undermining of science will lead to system breakdowns. And this is in the case where a system is dependent and reliant on science. It's a technically-based system. So what about the age of reason? Well, look, it's up, to, it's up to us to ensure the biosecurity systems receive the stewardship they need. Uh, but how do we do that? This conference I, that I was at, I told you about, was an important one because it was a launch of the decade of, la of land care. See, see how attached I am to land care. <laughs> decade of biosecurity, so the next 10 years. What's important about that, the, 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 aim of the, the aim of the decade of biosecurity is to get everyone involved. Everyone at least to have an awareness of what biosecurity is and why it's important. But in 10 years' time, to have the population of Australia biosecurity aware. And they talk about 25 million pairs of eyes. And that, that awareness can take many forms. That can be, you know, people out there seeing things which aren't a bit right and reporting them. That looks a bit unusual. I'll report that. So one way, just a simple way you can do that is to visit that website. You can sign off, sign up, and you can actually get a, you know, get a newsletter and be part of here what's going on. Uh, a number of organisations, including the Tasmanian government, are part of that decade of biosecurity, all the governments of Australia, and a number of other organisations as well, environmental ones, industry ones as well. So it's a really good vehicle of awareness that I see. So you can do that and then tell your friends. So thank you very much. It, if you do want more information, uh, I've left my cards down the back as well. Feel free to take that. If you want to follow up on any of these points later, I'm happy to, to talk to you about it. I'm sure there'll be some questions for seeking further information right now. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about this monkey virus that's come into the country. Um, are you involved in that or the monitoring of that? Uh, Biosecurity Tasmania is. I'm not personally. No, I'm, I'm uh, the chief plant protection officer, so I deal with plants, which is probably a lot nicer. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I, th I think it's probably a neat illustration of the point that I was making about the movement of, of pests and diseases around the world. It's so much easier now. A number of viruses. COVID's been a, a really neat example, and I think. Well, I'm sure this paper's already been published on that, but if you look at the, the spread of that from the, 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 point of the, the point of detection, or what's thought to be the point of detection around the world and the time frame, you could do some really neat maps. Monkey virus would be no different. There's a whole range of other ones. The other thing which I want to make a point there is, is I've clearly, I, it was interesting when I saw the media reporting on that, and I suspect it's because we've got a very sensitised media now in relation to these sorts of things, which is good. <laughs> that that's come out, but the actual, the actual occurrence of, of these things around the world is quite, quite significant and, and, and very common. So maybe if we had had COVID, we wouldn't have, you know, no one would have bothered reporting on monkey virus. Uh, hi, it's Duncan Farquhar here. How Hello, are you, Duncan. Andrew? Good to see you. <laughs> um, the Australian Academy of Science has a program called Taxonomy Australia and they have a mission to discover and document all the remaining Australian species of plants, animals, fungi, and other organisms in a generation. Uh, their estimate is that 70% of Australia's species are yet to be discovered. Mm. Uh, so you, you must be operating in a, an environment, uh, despite your considerable talents and, and capabilities, we're still operating in an environment of considerable ignorance uh, with all your uh, capabilities, uh, 
what sorts of contributions can your organisation make to that national goal of the Australian Academy of Science to discover uh, remaining species of within Australia? And is that how does that dovetail with the biosecurity challenge? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Duncan. Uh, and I think I think that I'll take first of all the general point you make about operating within you know, that level of ignorance. And I think that's very true. You know, at times, like, we have all the systems that we can have, and you do the best you can in that, but there's an unknown out there. I think the contribution that can be made, I mean, what you, you see it a lot in plant biosecurity now with detection of viruses, the technologies which can actually detect viruses and class them appropriately taxonomically, that's building up that knowledge all the time, and that's constant. So, so I think from the the dovetailing of the biosecurity part of it is probably from the point of view of, uh, and in the plant area, it's probably from the point of view of the, you know, the pests and diseases and that sort of thing being found or being identified. But I think the point you make about, that's one of the big challenges, and I probably should list that there, is the challenge that we don't know everything. And in fact, we probably don't know that much. And I, I'll say that broadly. I think that's exciting because <laughs> there's so much more to discover and there's always targets you can do. But nevertheless, that places big challenges, I think, in terms of what we do and how we run it, build our systems. They have to be resilient and they have to be flexible. Hi, Kirsten. Uh, I was just wondering how all this data is going to be managed. Will it be through a blockchain technology, perhaps? And, and, and who protects that information? How transparent is it and does everybody get to see it? I mean, is every part of nature going to be entered into a blockchain database? <laughs> Look, that's a, that's a, a fantastic question as well and is one of the challenges. And I'm glad you raised that because that slide I had about data to intelligence, I, I, I can talk from the science point of view and say this is really valuable for me. There's a whole range of other issues in terms of how that data is collected, how it's stored, how it's secured, the nature of the data itself. Some data can be very specific. I mean, I, 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 there has to be a lot of controls around it. The blockchain component you talked about, and perhaps some, uh, you know, I think there are some blockchain exponents who may, might jump on me for this, but I see the, the, uh, uh, the traceability systems that I mentioned there being blockchain-based. So basically, you know, secure uh, computer-coded records of transport from point A to point B with treatment points, you know, which are secure, can't be tampered with, that sort of thing. That's where I'd see the blockchain stuff coming in. Maintenance of databases, database, the database structure is going to have to be very sophisticated. Now, that already is at an Australian government level. You know, I mean, there's a lot of information being collected out there. It's of the nature in relation to products, pests and diseases but clearly uh, the, the ethical aspects around that of where those edges are in terms of managing that and where you, know, you, you don't want to breach privacy, they have to be addressed and have to be documented. And to, to an extent, they, they actually are with that, but imagine as the technology grows and the power to collect information and more importantly, uh, analyse it and convert it to intelligence grows, that's a really valid point, I think. We have to really think about that as a, as a population. Are, are actually at the same level as your ambitions to collect all this data? I'd probably agree with you. Yeah. And it's a bit like the technology racing ahead of the, you know, the negotiations, that sort of thing. And, mm. and, and I think it gathers pace. It's not like sort of just this constant gradual. I think we're going up almost exponentially in the ability to do these sort of things. Yeah, what you wish for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, following on from that, uh, Sue Kilpatrick from um, UTAS. I'm doing a project at the moment that's looking at um, agri-food producers and knowledge, people who have knowledge. Now, clearly we're talking a lot about knowledge. The blockchain is one extreme. I was going to ask the question, though, before we got that far. But I'm really interested in how you think that our food producers, not just the uh, agricultural producers, but the food processing food producers, can find out what they need to know about things everything from new pests that might be arrive, ar arriving uh, through to the, the blockchain technologies. I think grain's got quite a sophisticated system at the moment. So how do you see getting this out to those people on the ground who are producing our food? Uh, look, really effective stakeholder engagement and communications approaches, modern ones as well. Uh, I think that's the only way. But engagement, when I talk to partnerships as well, 
I think that's where they come out. But this is commitment to genuine partnerships. So, you know, you've got the table, everyone's around there, they're committed to the same thing. Knowledge is shared equally in that sense. But the, the thing I would say, Sue, is it's critically important that we do have that. Because this isn't, this isn't about government delivering the ideal system. It can't. It can play a part in that, it can take a lead, but it can't do the whole lot without the, in this sense, without the industry. It won't be effective. So that, that, they certainly need to be part of that. I do, look, I, once again, I see that area as being able to be improved a lot, and, and I do see it improving. Uh, but we do, have that, we do have connections there, I think. And something as you know, simple as a decade of biosecurity as well, those sorts of things, you know, you can look at them surface, a uh, surface value, but they've actually got some in-depth value of people genuinely connecting into those, being part of that, and then generating their own conversations and understanding. Hi. Um, so it was thought that um, robots making kill decisions was a while away, but actually it's been happening for a while now on the Great Barrier Reef with um, hunting robots hunting um, crown of thorns starfish. Um, do you see anything sort of equivalent ever happening on in a terrestrial environment, or and um, possibly I'd related to this. What about feral cats? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, technologically, yes, definitely can see that. Uh, and if we're talking ro robotics and these other things, I think there's a whole range of issues. It's a bit like the data stuff as well, that they have to be within structures. You know, we can't just charge ahead with technology. As I say, I can get excited as a scientist about this and that, but it's actually, it's a tempered excitement within, within a knowledge that we, we have to think through what we're actually doing and we have to have these things working for us. But I think technologically, yes. <laughs> I'm a plant scientist. <laughs> That's not my job. <laughs> Did not use that line. <laughs> I'm intrigued to know how a mobile phone can possibly detect DNA. Can you explain it simply? Yeah, look, it, it's linked. I mean, in these cases, these instruments are actually linked through to, you know, a small portable analysis unit. But the phone itself does the actual analysis and provides you the report. Uh, but, yeah, the, the application of smartphones for a whole range of things is, is, it can be quite wide. It already is, but can be quite wide, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one... Um, what advantage do Labradors have over beagles? <laughs> and more seriously, how much of an obstacle to biosecurity would be free trade agreements? Have there been an obstacle in the past? Okay, uh, look, I'll, I'll take that second one first. Uh, I don't know about an obstacle. Uh, in fact, uh, under the, for instance, under the, the World Trade Organization with the trade agreements, biosecurity is a very valid point in which you can, you know, take certain actions or not take certain actions. So, for instance, you can restrict entry on a biosecurity basis. The basis of that, though, is you have to provide the technical data to underpin that. So you can even stop entry uh, subject to gathering the data to actually show this is the evidence, you know, in terms of why we're doing that. What you can't do is say, is use biosecurity without data as, as a, as a you know, trade lot. So, so I don't know about uh, I don't know about like free trade agreements being a hindrance, but it can be used in the wrong way. But under the under the, the international rules, data has to be provided and a commitment to that data being gathered. If it's not there, if it's there, you've got a basis for actually you know undertaking a certain restriction if you wish. Uh, beagles and Labradors, I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Internet. I've been subject to a scam from America trying to get my money from my bank. So I've had to change my bank, but I have to say thank you to the federal government people in Sydney that watch these things. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I'll pass on your thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
And I just have perhaps a rather silly question. You, you have mentioned a few times that you're, you're a plant scientist and there's a sort of plant section and an animal section, but surely there's, there's an awful lot of overlap. I mean, uh, how does that work? Oh, look, absolutely, yeah. I, uh, I, I won't talk in silos. There's a lot of interconnectivity. And I'll give a good example, actually, is in the, the response capability. We have generic response capabilities. So whether it's an animal uh, biosecurity issue or an animal disease or pests coming in, plant pests or disease, we had the same response and we share resources in that sense. So it's interlinked. The system has to be interlinked. It can't operate as silos. If, you, if we have a system that is siloed and operating like that, uh, it, it won't be effective. So no, so we, this, is, this is nationally as well, internationally it's probably as well, but nationally, certainly at the state level, yeah, we do cross over. The luck we have in Tasmania is we're a relatively small group as well. So even though necessity means we have to do that, we get some positive benefits. So don't, if, don't interpret what I'm saying as, you know, we're operating separately, we're not. One more. <laughs> oh, just a quick one to follow on from uh, that question. The, the plant versus animal uh, incursion rate, uh, uh, just getting a sense of your work rate compared to the animal guys, I suspect that plants is much bigger, is that right? Uh, oh, it is much bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's frequent. Uh, you know that that uh, the plant issues would probably be would dominate a lot more, and there's a whole right range of reasons for that. But yes, that, that's correct, Duncan. Yeah. Nevertheless, you know each one's dealt with on a, on a, in its on its own merits, if you like, and on a, on a case by case basis. But yeah, we certainly have a lot, probably a lot more targets or biosecurity targets than say the the animals area would. Mm. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> and thank you for your interest and those excellent questions as well.